Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Brad Rattlehoover and I'm the president of the Community Tax Law Project. We want to thank you for participating and joining us today in our webinar entitled Seeking Penalty Relief from the Internal Revenue Service. We have a great group of panelists that we'll introduce shortly, but as the, uh, a member of CTLP, I wanted to kind of make sure you knew the background of this organization and the great things that it's doing. Uh, the Community Tax Law Project was founded in 1992. It's still the oldest independent uh, low-income taxpayer clinic that provides representation to Virginia taxpayers uh, that need help with either federal or state tax disputes. Between the staff that we have, including our staff attorney and executive director and interns and then pro bono volunteers, we serve over a thousand Virginia taxpayers each year. For today's presentation, I want to thank our sponsors, Kiter, Williams Mullen, Hunton Andrews Kurth, Dixon Hughes Goodman, McGuire Woods, and LeClaire Ryan for all the things that they do financially to support the Community Tax Law Project. I also want to thank you for participating. Uh, we did offer this CLE uh, for free, but we would encourage and appreciate if anyone is willing to make a donation and there will be a button that you can click uh, on your screen to link over to the Community Tax Law Project's website. And obviously all contributions are welcome and helpful as we continue to do these great things. I'm going to now turn it over to Matthew Cooper. Matthew is a senior manager with the Tax Controversy Group at Ernst & Young LLP. I'm going to let him introduce our panelists and then we'll get started. Matthew. Thanks, Brad, and thanks, our, thanks CTLP for having me. So on today's uh, webinar, um, Brad will be acting as the moderator, and then we're honored to have two government attorneys on the webinar as well. Michael Franklin is an attorney with the IRS Office of Chief Counsel, Associate Chief Counsel of Procedure and Administration. Procedure and Administration is the office within Chief Counsel National Tax Group that has subject matter jurisdiction over most civil penalties. So we're delighted to have Michael on the call. And along with Michael, we have Timothy Hevner, who is the IRS Associate Chief Counsel for Small Business and Self-Employed for Richmond, which means he's the manager of the group of attorneys in the SBSC Division Counsel Office who advises the SBSC um, and handles trials um, in the tax court. So we're delighted to have Tim as well. And then last but not least, we have Nancy Rosner, who is a senior staff attorney with the Community Tax Law Project. So Nancy does great work working for CLTLP, helping low-income and English as second language taxpayers with a variety of tax issues, and so she has a lot of experience on these types of penalties issues as well. So as Brad said, we're delighted everyone here is here to join us, and we hope to have a, a good discussion, and feel free to ask any questions. And now I'm going to turn it over back to Brad. Thanks, Matt. And as far as questions, I think you have the ability to send us a message through the system. If you have any questions, obviously let us know, and we're happy to weave those into the presentation. We'll try to save some time at the end for questions, uh, but if you send in a question and I don't answer it right away, I'll make sure to bring it up at some point throughout the slides, uh, throughout the webinar today. Again, we said that the purpose of this webinar is to discuss penalties, and we thought it would be helpful to have representatives of the government and also representatives from the private practice that could give you their take on various issues that we see when we're representing taxpayers facing civil penalties. So looking through the agenda, you're going to see that we're going to cover a variety of penalties today and give you background and information about how the penalties are in play. For example, the delinquency penalties for failure to timely file or pay something the accuracy-related penalties that could be imposed if, for example, you're negligent or not um, you know, complying with the rules, and we'll talk about the differences between the two and how they can sometimes apply. Both of them can apply and how that can interplay. Uh, and then we'll also talk about generally the purpose of these penalties um, and a few miscellaneous. And towards the end of the presentation, we're going to spend some time hopefully more practical side of things, which is if you're representing a taxpayer, what are the things you need to think about and whether or not you can request request relief, uh, either under the first time abatement, or if you have a valid defense, what we typically call as reasonable cause, that could result in the ability to argue with the IRS or assert to the IRS 
that the penalty should not be imposed. So we'll try to give you some examples that we've seen and talk about what strategies we take uh, when we're trying to get our clients, um, if we feel they have a good defense, how we get the IRS to agree. And then we'll hear from Tim and Michael if there's some things that they see that don't work, do work, and then hopefully have some ideas of what what you should be thinking about. But overall, we're trying to give you a, a brief summary on the various penalties so you are able to um, you know, think about it when you're making these representations of clients. So, uh, And at the very end, like we said, we'll talk about the strategies for raising the abatements. When's the right time? That's always a good question, dealing with exam. IRS appeals, if your examination didn't go the way you had hoped, or if there's still some unresolved issues that you feel like the IRS appeals office needs to resolve. And then even if things don't finish up in the IRS appeals and you're not able to get a fully agreed case, you have the option to go to courts, whether it's the tax court or if you're doing a refund case, whether you're going to go and seek relief from a federal district court, a judge, or the court of claims. And so we'll walk through kind of where in the process you see the penalties first being imposed and when you want to take time to address them. So that's the goal for today, and we hope that you uh, get some practical advice out of this and, and get a little bit of knowledge. So let's get started with our first uh, background on regarding what is the purpose of penalties. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start off by, before we get into the IRM provision that's cited here on the slide, um, just talk a little um, about a little bit of background on how the IRS instituted its current penalty policy. So in 1955, there were approximately 14 penalty provisions in the code. And as most of us know now, there are a lot more than that. There are approximately 10 times that number. So uh, with the increasing number of penalty provisions, uh, the IRS recognized the need to develop a fair, consistent, and comprehensive approach to penalty administration. So in 1987, the commissioner of the IRS, uh, with this in mind, established a task force, to do, task force to do just that. And in 1989, the commissioner's executive task force issued a report on civil tax penalties that in part at least made certain recommendations uh, to resolve inconsistencies. Um, those recommendations were to develop a penalty policy statement uh, that emphasized that civil tax penalties exist for the purpose of encouraging voluntary compliance. Um, and that penalty policy statement can now be seen in policy statement 20-1, uh, but also to develop a single consolidated handbook on penalties for all employees. Um, and as most, most people know that the the handbook for employees that we're talking about is the IRM, and that brings us to um, the IRM provisions on voluntary compliance. So uh, back to the slide, penalties exist to encourage voluntary compliance by supporting the standards of behavior expected by the Internal Revenue Code. And so penalties advance the mission of the IRS when they encourage voluntary compliance. Uh, the IRS has actually formalized this obligation to the public in its mission statement, which in part says that the IRS role is to help the large majority of compliant taxpayers with the tax law while ensuring that the minority who are unwilling to comply pay their fair share. Uh, but what is voluntary compliance? Uh, this is when taxpayers assess their tax liabilities against themselves and pay them voluntarily. Um, and voluntary compliance is achieved when a taxpayer makes a good faith effort to meet the uh, tax obligations defined by the code. Uh, so like this slide says, for most taxpayers, uh, this will simply mean preparing an accurate return, uh, filing it on time, paying the taxes due, um, and most penalties will apply to any behavior that fails to meet these obligations. So penalties do encourage voluntary compliance in a number of ways. Uh, they define the standards of compliant behavior uh, because compliant self-assessment requires a taxpayer to know the rules for filing returns and paying taxes, uh, penalties do help set the rules, so to speak. Um, penalties also define remedial consequences for noncompliance. So penalties support voluntary compliance by uh, assuring compliant taxpayers that tax offenders are identified and penalized. And lastly, penalties provide monetary sanctions against taxpayers who do not meet that standard. 
Michael, one thing I wanted to comment on, on you know, the purpose of penalties, and I think from the private practice what we see is that, you know, we obviously recognize the IRS has a lack of resources and staff to, you know, properly audit probably as many taxpayers as they probably want to or should. Um, so one thing we're talking about, uh, you know, is you know, the likelihood of being audited and being, you know, caught, if you will, I don't like that word, but uh, the penalties being imposed being a low threshold. Um, not that that's a reason to take positions that you shouldn't, but I think we're, you know, sometimes we don't think the penalties should be imposed, but I think the IRS has to set the stage that, you know, these are serious, and if you're not meeting the requirements, the penalty should be there. And so, you know, we hope to get the penalties off for each of our clients, but that doesn't mean that that necessarily should be the case. So don't assume that just because you're going in and disputing some of the underlying issues, the penalties are automatically going to be off the table, and we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. So. Yeah, and Brad, I would add, I think, going to your point, the overall audit coverage rate, I believe, is less than 1% uh, for individuals. It's With an income over $1 million, I think it's like 4.5%, and corporations, it varies from like 4% for small corporations up to 50% for the very largest corporations who are always under continuous audit. But like Michael was saying, penalties serve an important role from the IRS's perspective in um, establishing that if the IRS feels that you're doing something that's wrong or doesn't meet an appropriate standard, there is that stick that's always available. Right, and I think that in addition to being severe enough for uh, the penalty to, de to deter noncompliance, uh, they should also be used as an opportunity to educate taxpayers uh, for future compliance. And that's a good segue. This is Tim. Um, the penalties matter because they, as been alluded to, and I think just said, teach us what we're supposed to do as practitioners. Obviously, I'm representing uh, the service, but practitioners and taxpayers who are not represented um, can understand the rules to, that they must play by and the standard they must meet by having penalties. Um, the, the service has tried over the last decade to move toward a more consistent and certainly a more frequent application. Some statistics that were available to me indicated that there may have been application of about, 50, in the neighborhood of 58,000 penalties in 05. That number was almost 500,000 penalties in 16. Um, so the, the frequency of the application certainly has increased by focusing on a consistent application on the services side and the chief counsel side. Um, the, the service has tried to make it uh, across the board that we should not trade penalties because it risks undercutting the efficient tax administration by reducing the deterrent effect. In fact, the uh, chief counsel notice 2004-36 that's referenced in the material there um, sets forth that policy and meshes with what a policy statement that's mentioned in the, in the appeals memo of June 21, 2004. We are not supposed to trade, and the service is not supposed to trade penalties as a negotiation tool um, or a bargaining point, but rather are supposed to, the service and counsel are supposed to look at whether on the facts and circumstances and applying the law, whether a penalty should be appropriately applied uh, in an even-handed manner, um, doing so as an effective tool to combat uh, proliferation of abusive uh, tax shelters, abusive programs, uh, and to assure voluntary compliance. Um, council's role in that, of course, is that they must consider they can still settle penalties. Appeals can still settle penalties. Chief counsel can still settle penalties but they should do so on a hazards of litigation standard. Um, they should develop them, they should review them, um, and make sure they're, the service should be make sure they're developed. Appeals doesn't really develop anything, they take what's in the file. Council certainly could develop further through discovery, both informal and formal, and they should do that to assure that the application of penalties is analyzed, and then certainly they can negotiate on a hazards of litigation um, standard. Taxpayers uh, certainly uh, 
the service and counsel on behalf of the service have the burden of production to establish any individual's liability for penalties under 7491. Um, however, the taxpayers still have the burden to show such things as reasonable cause, substantial authority, similar and similar defenses. Um, uh, whether uh, an individual sought advice certainly is another is a factor. Uh, it's but however it's not controlling. The fact that you had advice isn't an automatic remo for removal of the penalties. Um, it, it's not in and of itself, but it's certainly a factor. It must show that the taxpayer. We must see that the taxpayer did actually rely on the advice. That that reliance was in good faith, or the taxpayer had. Uh, and that reliance was reasonable. All these things are in set forth in the policy uh, statement to highlight that the importance of penalties in the administrative process um, and that the takeaway from all this is we should not use them as a bargaining tool. They are independently should be analyzed in each circumstance both at the IRS level, the appeals level, and the council level. Um, and it's very summarily summarized in the appeals memo of June 21st saying we will not trade penalties. It's a very short memo, um, but merits and hazards only. So um, I think that's the takeaway of penalties matter. Uh, it's fairness. It's doing it objectively um, and trying to apply it consistently. So all taxpayers, including those who have complied, are um, sort of represented by us and are treated fairly. Um, certainly the level at which the penalties are and what the nature of the penalties that we're going to discuss today go from, you know, negligence or disregard. Some are mechanically applied on a computational basis but for reasonable cause or disclosure. And then others are to uh, to combat abuses. Um, and so this, the standard is higher as it goes along, but the importance of them Certainly across the board are important, but when combating abusive type actions, they're very vital to assuring the fairness and how other taxpayers view what others are doing when it is truly abusive. So it's important that we pursue those and, and apply those in the right circumstances. Thanks, Tim. Before we get into specifics about the failure to file and start of the delinquency penalties, I wanted to ask Matt a few questions about just kind of the general approach, um, whether he's seeing um, penalties being imposed with the more correspondence audits that we're seeing these days and less revenue agents being available to um, conduct the field audits. Are, are you seeing a lot of taxpayers having to respond, Matt, to correspondence audits, pe uh, penalties being imposed? I have seen that. Uh, a lot of times, in some ways, that's easier for the IRS to impose because they just, you know, the system will automatically determine that there was an understatement because $20,000 was left off from a K-1 that's, you know, in the IRS system and it's information matching. And then the IRS has, you know, the automated underreporter and they might just send a notice saying, here's this understatement on your return and here's this 20% penalty. And then you would have to respond with your explanation as to why you have reasonable cause or why no penalty should apply. Whereas if it's a real exam, whether you have a revenue agent or a team for large taxpayers, you, you've been having a dialogue from the beginning of the exam. It's been going on for a while. So you've had more of a back and forth and you should at least have general expectation as to whether that exam team is going to raise the penalty and they should talk to you about that if it is a consideration. Yeah, I haven't seen a whole lot of trading going on, obviously, pre or post this uh, memorandum, Tim. I think I'm more seeing it as, you know, having that discussion like Matt's talking. But, Nancy, can you comment just briefly about kind of the low-income taxpayer space and how penalties are, are cropping up or, or how are you, when, when are you seeing them um, or are you getting the clients after the audit's already come on board? They're pretty much all correspondence audits um, that we're seeing as well. They're getting the letters asserting the penalties, and we're either, you know, raising it with appeals or um, if we can catch it early enough, great, um, as happens a lot with our clients. So they're coming to us maybe even after they've been assessed, um, and we're trying to deal with it after the fact. But um, for the most part, it's really 
pretty much all correspondence, audits, very little, you know, person-to-person -person communication. So we yeah, and Brad, I was go ahead. Matt. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, going back to what Nancy said, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the penalties I see also is not even the accuracy-related penalty, which is what we have been talking about, but we will talk more in detail about, you know, failure to file and failure to pay, and those, right, are obviously usually just automatic if you have a late return or if your extension bounces for some other reason. And then just one other thing I just wanted to note is that there has been talk over the last five or so years about, well, should there be penalty reform broadly? Um, as Michael mentioned at the beginning, penalties, the number of penalties in the code has expanded by tenfold, and the ABA and the ASCPA and others have written letters to Congress asking for penalty reform, but it was interesting to note, at least to me, that in the TCJA there wasn't much on uh, penalties from that perspective. So, Well, Nancy, when you're dealing with a correspondence audit, you know, as Matt and others have mentioned, not really much of a, there's no one to trade with, so I don't really see how that's going <laughs> to happen, but are you, you're just then jumping to reasonable cause, which is what we'll talk about later, or what what are you going to do if you did get that client early enough to where there's still the back and forth with exam? Sure, and I think, you know, we will address it a little later, you know, reasonable cause should really be examined first um, so that first time abatement can be preserved if needed later. Um, so we would definitely evaluate the taxpayer first for reasonable cause to see if we can assist them in that way. Um, and then perhaps if they're not eligible for that, move on to considering them for first time penalty abatement. And each of these has different requirements, so not everyone is going to be eligible for each or, or both. Um, it depends on whether they're typically tax compliant and whether they have um, an issue that the IRS would view as an acceptable reason for not filing on time or paying on time or, you know, fulfilling their obligations as a taxpayer. Okay. Well, let's start with uh, the first example with Nancy of um, Start with the delinquency. Tell us a little bit more about those. Okay, so um, as many of you probably know, um, if you're due a refund on your return, there's no penalty if you file a late tax return. However, if you file your federal tax return late and you do owe tax on the return, there's two main penalties that may apply. The first is the failure to file penalty for late filing, and then there's also a failure to pay penalty for paying late. So there are two separate penalties. The failure to file penalty, penalty is normally 5% of the unpaid taxes for each month or part of a month that the tax return is late. That penalty does max out at 25% of the unpaid taxes. Then the uh, late filing penalty, if you file your return more than 60 days after the due date or the extended due date, the minimum penalty for late filing is the smaller of $210 or 100% of the unpaid tax. So, for example, if you were to file your return, let's say 65 days late, you owed $150 on the return, the late filing penalty would be $150. So your tax liability would be, you know, the original liability on the return would be $150, your penalty would be $150. Um, so it can add up pretty quickly. Um, as far as the failure to pay penalty, normally that penalty is one half of 1% per month of your unpaid taxes. And that also applies for each month or part of a month that your taxes remain unpaid. And it does start accruing the date after the taxes are due. That penalty can also build up to as much as 25% of the unpaid taxes. Um, importantly, the one-half of 1% 1 rate increases to 1%, so that penalty will go up if the tax remains unpaid within 10 days after the IRS issues a notice of intent to levy property. Also, uh, if a taxpayer files their return by the due date and requests an installment agreement, um, the one-half of 1% 1 rate decreases to one quarter of 1% for any month in which an installment agreement is in effect. So there is a benefit there for going on an installment agreement. The penalty rate does go down 
Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the combined penalty per month. If the failure to file and failure to pay penalty both apply in the same month, which often happens with our clients, um, the maximum amount charged is going to be 5% per month. After five months, if you still haven't paid, the failure to file penalty will max out, but the failure to pay penalty continues until the, pass, the tax is paid up to a 25% cap. So again, 25% of the unpaid tax. The maximum total penalty for failure to file and pay is 47.5% of the unpaid tax. Um, so you can see, you know, you can end up really racking up quite a bit of debt, um, not only by owing on your return, but then filing late and paying late as well. So with that, the advice would be, you know, file even if you can't pay. We, we get so many taxpayers that are scared to file because they owe and they know that they can't pay, so they just don't file the return on time, um, not realizing that that ends up hurting them even more in the end. So the recommendation is definitely file even if you can't pay because in most cases the failure to file penalty is 10 times more than the failure to pay penalty. So if you can't pay in full when you file, you should really try to file on time and pay as much as you can um, when you do file. Another thing I'd like to point out is that an extension to file is typically not an extension to pay. So it's also important to remind clients that just because they may have requested an extension to file, it does not necessarily mean they also have an extension to pay. They should still try to pay as much as possible with their return. Um, however, if you requested an extension of time to file your tax return by the due date, and you pay at least 90% of the taxes you owe by the due date, you may not end up facing a failure to pay penalty as long as you pay the remaining balance by the extended due date. Um, and you will owe interest on any taxes you pay after the April 15th due date. Now, there are some exceptions to the general deadlines for filing a return and paying tax um, for some special groups. So if you're a member of the armed forces and serving in a combat zone or contingency operation, if you're a citizen or a resident alien working abroad, or if you were a victim in certain disaster situations, um, the IRS has the authority to extend filing and payment deadlines. Now, the IRS may abate your penalties for filing and paying late if you can show reasonable cause and that the failure wasn't due to willful neglect. Um, they can also abate the penalties under administrative remedies, and we will be delving further into these topics a bit later into the presentation. So, Nancy, the two takeaways I had from that was the tax is imposed on the unpaid portion. So if a client had W-2 withholdings or something along the lines, that uh, has not, that doesn't mean, they're not going to pay tax, these delinquency type tax on those, um, but they are going to pay on any unpaid portion, so that's important. And Matt, I always get the uh, interest rules wrong, but interest accrues on any penalties assessed, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I thought so. So, so you're looking at tax due penalties up to 47.5% if they don't top file within five months and don't pay for a long time, and you're looking at interest on top of these. So the numbers really can become high, so it's definitely something that, as Nancy said, get those tax returns filed timely and get payments in as quick as possible. Uh, but let's shift gears now into some more delinquency type penalties when it's applying to things other than the income uh, tax return or a excise gifts. There's some other ones out there that you might not be quite as aware of. All right, so I guess we're moving on to uh, penalties for failure to file correct information returns. And information return penalties are important tools uh, for the IRS to collect at the least cost the proper amount of tax revenue. Again, like we discussed earlier, uh, penalties do provide the service with an important tool to achieve that goal because they enhance voluntary compliance by taxpayers. Um, and the term information return uh, means any statement, form, or return as described in 6724D or the 6721 and 6722 Treasury Regs. 
Um, so although I think Nancy is going to talk about reasonable cause um, generally at a later point uh, during this presentation, I think it is important to note that an information reporting penalty under 6721 or 6722 may be waived if it can be shown that the error was due to reasonable cause, um, but also not due to willful neglect. Um, and the specific rules for applying reasonable cause to those two penalties um, can be found in the 6724 Treasury regs. Um, so the first penalty, um, 6721, uh, provides a penalty for failure to file correct information returns. Um, and for information returns or statements, a penalty may be imposed for filing returns after the due date without all the required information um, on, on paper when required to be filed uh, electronically or if filed in a non-processable form. Uh, no more than one 6721 penalty can be imposed per return even though there can be more than one failure per return. Um, and again, for purposes of 6721, the term information return is defined in 6724D. So for the 2018 tax year, uh, the penalty is uh, $260 per return, and this is capped at uh, $3.2185 million. And if a failure is corrected within 30 days after the due date, that the return is required to be filed, the penalty is reduced, or if the failure is corrected more than 30 days after the due date, uh, but on or before August 1st of the filing year, the penalty is reduced. And increased penalty amounts do apply in cases of intentional disregard, um, in which case there's actually no maximum penalty amount. Um, and for this section in 6722 as well, intentional uh, disregard occurs when a filer knows or should know of a rule or regulation but chooses, chooses to ignore its requirements. So the facts would generally show that the filer was required to file, knew or should have known about the requirement to file, uh, but consciously chose not to file or recklessly disregarded that duty. Uh, 6722, uh, similar to 6721, except it provides a, for a penalty when a pay statement is not timely or correctly furnished. Um, the penalty is imposed for each failure to furnish a pay statement on or before the due date to the person to whom the statement should be furnished, uh, to furnish all information required or furnish correct information. And like 6721, uh, no more than one 6722 penalty is imposed per pay statement, um, even though there may be more than one failure per statement. And for purposes of 6722, pay statement is defined, again, in 6724D. Um, and the calculation, again, is very similar to 6721. That's $260 per statement uh, with the same cap, and again, increased in the case of intentional disregard. Uh, moving on to some specific information uh, return reporting requirements, uh, 6698 provides a penalty for a failure to file a partnership return so here we're talking about a late filed uh, Form 1065 U.S. Return of Partnership Income or Form 1066, which is a U.S. Real Estate Mortgage Investment Conduit Income Tax Return. And the penalty calculation is a, a little more complex. It's computed by multiplying the applicable base penalty rate, which after two, December 31st, 2009, is $195. Uh, times the number of partners, times the number of months late, um, capped at a maximum of 12 months. Uh, similar to 6698, Section 6699 provides a penalty for failure, failure to file an S corporation return. So this would be your uh, late filed 1120S uh, U.S. income tax return for an S corporation. Um, and the calculation is uh, similar to the 6698 calculation. So just for people's background, uh, Michael, the information and pay statements, we're, we're typically talking what, W-2s, 1099s, what, what are we talking about? So we're talking about things, yeah, exactly right. We're talking about things like W-2s and 1099s. Okay, so I had one where got a, a big whopping number under 6721 where a client issued a lot of uh, 1099Cs of the a banking finance company and had a lot of uh, cancellation of debt. 
cleaning out, they made a policy to get rid of uh, quite a few old and cold debt, if you will, and issued 1099Cs. And I guess the information and either was wrong when they got it inputted or wrong uh, somehow along the way. And the uh, 6721 penalty got up to about mm, $600,000. There was a lot of uh, missing pens or taxpayer identification numbers or something. And so now the question is reasonable cause. But one thing I always get confused on these is you must file the return, which is the 6721, and you must furnish it to the payee under 6722. So you potentially could have a penalty under both. It's just not multiple penalties within each one. Is that That's my understanding, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. And then, Brad, to go into your point, I have seen some of these that are also very large, and um, as Michael indicated at the beginning of his discussion of this slide, the regulations under 6724 are very specific as to what you need to show um, for reasonable cause. You need to show significant mitigating factors, which could be a good compliance history, that the failure arose from events beyond your control, and then as well that uh, you acted, re that the filer acted in a responsible manner. So if you're responding to any of these types of penalties, it's very important to look at those regulations and go through that go through that list and those factors and try and address all of those because these penalties are usually automatic from Philadelphia Service Center where they know that there's some kind of mismatch. It's not usually late. There's something usually what well, could be late, but then oftentimes it's because there's something incorrect. It, there's an incorrect TIN on a hundred of the payees. So. The, the, the IRS system notices that, and then they'll spit out the penalty notice and say, "Please explain why again you have no you have reasonable cause, or these penalties should not be assessed." So that's from the service center, and that's more missing or incorrect information. Uh, what if you just you know how do the IRS figure out when you just don't file one? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I would. I don't know. I I guess it's presumably they could find that out upon audit, right? That if they're doing a, an audit of, maybe it comes up with employment tax, right? The IRS does a lot of employment tax audits, and they look ask for your W-2s, and you can't provide them. But I think most of the time, it's either late or incorrect. Nancy, have you ever had any situations where, I've seen this a few times, where you have undocumented workers or something where they, you have a worker that doesn't have a Social Security number, so you don't issue a 1099 or a W-2, and now you're looking at problems on all different fronts. But anything in the low-income taxpayer space dealing with information returns, or are you more on the recipient side of things? Yeah, I can't say that we've seen a lot of the, you know, penalties being asserted in that way. Um, we've had all sorts of, um, you know, undocumented workers working under a social that may not belong to them, um, or you know, working using their ITIN number to get a 1099, sometimes even an ITIN number on their W-2. Um, but I, none of those situations have we seen the, that we're aware of that the IRS then, you know, took a closer look at the employer himself. Okay. Well, let's uh, talk about a few other return types of, types of penalties that are in play under the delinquency side. Sure, and um, these are mostly for corporations, rather than, but it can be for individuals as well who have certain interests overseas. Um, the big one is under six, Section 6038. If a you know an individual or corporation has what they call a controlled foreign corporation or a controlled foreign partnership, if you have over a certain interest in a foreign entity, the IRS wants to know about that ownership interest, and so. Those forms are supposed to be attached to your income tax return, the underlying tax return. Um, and similarly, for entity, if you have, if you are owned by, if you're a foreign-owned corporation, there's the 5472 penalty. And then there are also a variety of other inter what we call international information returns, such as 926s, where you have a transfer of foreign property or 8938 is if you have a foreign financial asset similar to an FBAR form, which you probably all have heard of. And the big thing is that if there's a late filing of these forms, there can be a significant penalty for the 5471s and the 5472s. 
well, 5471s, it is $10,000 per return. With 5472, um, it was just increased from $10,000 to $25,000. So if you're a large corporation and you have a lot of these types of forms, and for whatever reason you file them late because you file your underlying 1120 late, there can be significant penalties. And it is important to note that at least in the 1120 and 1065 filer context, um, if, you, if the IRS receives a late original 1120 or 1065, with um, the IRS computer will automatically spit out penalty notices for these 5471s and 5472s. So it is pretty common for larger taxpayers to receive those types of notices just because it's automatic. Um, if and then and then the other big thing to know is that the failure to timely file or to file a materially incomplete international information return creates um, your statute of limitations does not start until the IRS receives the international information return. So that can be a big deal for corporations or other entities for purposes of financial accounting purposes or otherwise that you file your 1120. Um, but you forget to include a 5471, you, re you realize two years later and then you file an amended return and include the 5471, um, under 6501C8, your statute of limitations hasn't started for your whole return until you file that amended return with the 5471. Um, if you can show a reasonable cause, your statute is only open for items on that international information return. But if the IRS says you don't have reasonable cause, your statute is open for the whole return from three years from when you filed that 5471. So again, that's something that catches some people by surprise but can be a big issue. And then the last thing I would point out is that uh, if you, unlike an original return that has a late 5471 or a 5472, if you file a timely 1040 or 1120 but then later on realize, oops, I left off, one of these international information returns. If you file an amended return and include the late form, and usually you would include a reasonable cause statement with it, in that situation, in the amended return context, the penalty is not automatic. So that's different from the original return context where it is automatic. So that's something to keep in mind. Usually on the amended returns, once they get the amended return, then the IRS would have to make the decision to audit that amended return and only then, if they think you don't have reasonable cause, would they impose the penalty. So just a, a, a little bit of a nuance there. Matt, with respect to some of these returns, 3520, 3520A, does the IRS, we had a question from the audience, does the IRS use the first time abatement rules to, if there's a mistake or something, to apply to abate the penalty, or is that first time abatement rules only apply to certain types of penalties? Yeah, that's a good question, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but it only applies to certain types of penalties. So um, it applies to failing, failure to file the income tax return, so a 1040 or 1120 or 1065, where the failure to file and failure to pay penalties, first time abatement applies. But for some of these other unique penalties, it, it depends, but if the IRS considers what they call an event-based filing, like a 3520 or we have a trust filing, in, in, in a lot of those types of situations, they would say first-time abatement does not apply, and then you would have to argue reasonable cause. I would note that as part of your reasonable cause argument, you should argue you have a good compliance history if that's true, but they won't just automatically abate it for first-time abatement in certain situations. And have you seen an increase in these penalties under 6038 with the ongoing efforts the IRS has on the offshore voluntary disclosure? Is that kind of bringing this more to light, or is this something that's just kind of always been around? No, I think since probably 2009, 2010, there's been a greater focus on these types of international information returns. So I think it's at least tangentially related to the whole focus on offshore voluntary disclosures. I think that created a focus and around that time frame is when they did the automatic assessments for the 5471s and 5472s. So that has um, definitely increased in the last eight or nine years. 
And then I would note, going to your question, Brad, on 3520s and 3520As, which are for trust, we didn't see a whole lot of those lately, but I think the IRS has started to focus on that, on those as well in the last year or so. Well, I, you know, working with some taxpayer clients who have some international investments, I, I see a wide variety of responses when I ask them, you know, have you and your tax return preparer, you know, talked through the rules relating to what disclosures are required depending on the type of investment? And I, and I get a, a wide variety of responses where we have tax return preparers that, you know, they understand and can do 1040s, 1120s, all these returns and know what they're what they're doing, but then the international side, it's almost a question of they don't really, really want to get into it, um, but, uh, but I've seen examples where it's really important if you have international, if your client has any type of international operations or any investments international to make sure someone's asking those questions and it's not an IRS agent, I uh, would much rather be filing based on the how difficult it is with or how high these penalties can be. Yeah, and some of those forms can be, at least for me, I'm not a CPA, can be complicated to fill out, right? And so even if the IRS came in and said, we think your form is materially or substantially incomplete, they theoretically could impose a penalty as well. So it's important to consider all that. Okay, we're going to switch gears here at this point to stop talking about our, our friend, the delinquency penalty, which obviously, you know, failing to file timely, failing to pay, failing to issue these statements, uh, prepare these statements, is an important one to discuss. We're going to switch now to the accuracy-related penalty. And this comes up under Code Section 6662, and this is what I think people think of more commonly as the 20% penalty. We'll talk about that that's not always the amount of the penalty. Um, and this is the one that I seem to deal with more and more often when I'm working on an audit or an appeal is, you know, the client has gone under audit and there's been items found, either income left off or deductions taken that weren't accepted for whatever reason. And now we're talking about should there be penalties uh, imposed on the amount of underpayment due to these items. And going back to what Michael mentioned at the very beginning, you know, Penalties play an important role, and to discourage behavior where we're having the IRS have to audit a taxpayer to find mistakes, penalties can be applied. And so the question is, what what types of penalties under the 6662 should we be thinking about? And I'm going to start off with focusing on the one that I think we, we see the most, or the two we see the most, the negligence or disregard of rules and substantial understatement. Those are the ones where the 20% penalty comes into play during an audit, and the question is reasonable cause or not to, and whether you meet these these rules. I'll, I'll let others talk about the substantial valuation, the statement, overstatement of pension liability, some of the other ones that have different penalty um, components, and you know these are all ones that we want to focus on when we're representing clients and thinking through an audit. But to start with, let's look at the 6662. Uh, B1 and B2, the negligence or substantial understatement. And like I said, these are typically 20% of the underpayment. Uh, you see here that there's a few that are going to be higher, 40%, but the ones that I think most of us will see often are the 20%, only going to be imposed per violation, um, even if multiple different types of penalties under 6662 could be applied. Uh, it's going to be imposed and it doesn't get reduced by any carryback of an NOL, which is treated more like a payment as opposed to reducing the penalty. So you can still have this penalty. So the question is, what is negligence? Or what is this disregard? What would be applied? And when we're focusing on negligence, lack of reasonable basis, what's the real standard? And this one is where we get lots of questions about, well, you know, I relied on my advisor. I, I didn't understand. I didn't know the rules. Um, but the burden of proof is on the taxpayer, and, and the government's going to look at a standard that's a reasonably prudent person. Um, you know, just not trying careless, reckless behavior. These things 
are not going to get there and not get you to arguing that it's not the penalty should not be imposed. But I think it's one that we want to um, always be aware of that they're they're out there. Now, just for the code people that like to look at the code, negligence is defined as any failure to make a reasonable attempt to comply. Um, and so, you know, the question is what's reasonable, whereas the substantial understatement, like we said earlier, the mathematical, uh, if there's a substantial understatement for any tax year, if the understatement is the greater, exceeds the greater of 10% of the tax required to be shown or $5,000. So sometimes, like you said, with the service centers, if the numbers work out and it meets the substantial understatement just from a pure numbers basis, the correspondence audits or the assessments might have this automatically thrown in there. Um, Matt, can can you remind me I'm on amended returns? So you file your original return and you know you don't think anything's wrong with it, but then you realize you, you left something off and you, something came to your mind. Are you going to be faced with this accuracy related penalty if you um, submit your amended return disclosing it? Right. So there's a concept called qualified amended returns, and it's in the regulations under Section 6664. And what that says is if a taxpayer files an amended return reporting additional income that was left off the original return, and you file that amended return before the IRS has opened up an examination of you before they know the issue, before um, it can't be like a tax shelter type case or where they've issued a request for promoter information and they know about it through some other source or through where they've already opened up the partnership that you're an investment in and you forgot to leave off the uh, K-1. But assuming you, you're you not under audit, you're not part of a tax shelter or a reportable transaction, um, and then you're not, you come in and you disclose on the amended return and you pay the additional tax. In that situation, the rules say that there should be no accuracy-related penalty because it's considered like you don't have an underpayment of tax because you've reported it on the amended return. So that's a good rule to know, and that's a good point, Brad, because that comes up a lot in, in my practice, and people say, we made this mistake, what should we do? And generally, the answer is, well, if you file an amended return, you come clean to the IRS, there should, you know, obviously you have to pay interest on it, but there shouldn't be any 20% accuracy related penalty in most cases. So let's take the example, Matt, where the IRS audit has started and you have that first meeting with a client and there, there are some mistakes and it's just glaring and you, and you know that the IRS is not one of the question whether the IRS is going to figure it out or not. It's just, it's just there. And so the, the question comes to me is, do you want to build rapport with the IRS revenue agent by, you know, just admitting to the mistakes up front and go ahead and submit an amended return and file it and say, all right, hey, you know, we, we, we know this is an issue and we, we've submitted this amended return, and you know, to be processed. Um, and, you know, let's, let us know if you think of anything else you want to address. My advice typically is don't file the return. You can give them a copy of what you would file, but would you agree that filing the return subjects you to this penalty automatically? Well, I think usually if you're under audit already, you would, again, right, it's a strategic decision taking into all the things that you just talked about, wh whether do you want to disclose it to the exam agent. A lot of times it is the right answer, or it's obviously always the taxpayer's call as to how they want to do, but we as practitioners are supposed to give all the pros and cons and one of the big pros is you're, bu you're building goodwill. Usually if you come forward and the agent hasn't identified the issue, they're going to be sympathetic with the fact that you voluntarily come forward and disclose it to them. But a lot of it depends on how big is the item, do you have any technical arguments to support that you took the position correctly on the original return, or is it just a pure mistake or something that you left off the return. So, yeah, there's a number of factors to go through as to whether and how you disclose it. And then the tax is only going to be on the unpaid amount that is attributable to the negligence or the substantial understatement. There are times where it's possible that only part of the IRS audit adjustment would be subject to tax because maybe there are certain sections or certain adjustments that are being made that do have reasonable cause or have a reasonable basis that you wouldn't, or proper disclosure where you wouldn't have the um, uh, 
that be opposed? So it doesn't have to apply to the whole thing, but it could. Right. It, they can they can bifurcate it or say, well, we think this, you know, five thousand dollars of it has no reasonable basis, so we're going to hit you with a penalty on that piece. But the rest, the twenty thousand dollars, the rest of it, we think you did have a reasonable basis, so you're good on that piece. All right, moving on to substantial understatements. Tim, do you want to take it away? Yeah, I, I did want to clarify something you said uh, in passing, okay. Brad. I think you said that the taxpayer has the burden on negligence, and that's almost right. That's almost 100% right. We have the burden, the service has the burden of production first mm. to then shift right. the burden to them. So we have burden of production first. And let's be frank, negligence is a lot more touchy-feely and harder to define and prove than substantial understatement. So the, as a lead-off or a lead-in into substantial understatement, on the correspondence audit, it's easier and path of least resistance is not um, lost on the service. And so there are a number, a large number of uh, assertions of substantial understatement that don't automatically purport to assert negligence because they're under the same section. But so carefully read your notices of deficiency, especially in the low income or correspondence audit space, as you've called it. Um, check to see because we do on our side to see if has the service asserted negligence or substantial understatement because often they'll do substantial understatement only because it's easier to meet our burden of production. Um, so I would urge you to look at that because right out of the gate, we, we as counsel have to decide, we do if we, we, again, under the policies that we talked about earlier, do have to still look at negligence, but if it wasn't asserted by the service, we have to decide if we're taking it on as a, quote, new issue or a new basis for that uh, assertion of the penalty, or are we strictly going to stick with substantial understatement? Because then if you get under the threshold that I'm about to talk about, the penalty could go away by threshold and computation rather than proof, per se. So um, now on to substantial understatement. Under Internal Revenue Code 6662B, um, substantial understatement is, the, uh, it is, as we've alluded to, really computational. It's 10% of the tax required to be shown on the return or $5,000, uh, you've got to get to $5,000. So it's the it exceeds the greater of those two numbers. So if you're under $5,000, no penalty for on the, under this basis for individuals. For corporations, it, it, it's a little bit more confusing because it exceeds the lesser of 10% of the tax required or $10,000. Um, and then, or 10 million, the lesser is 10 million and 10%, but it still has that threshold, and it's enhanced from five for individuals to 10,000 as the minimum for corporations for substantial understatement. Um, the understatement is defined as the excess of the amount of tax required to be shown on the tax return over the amount of tax actually shown on the return reduced by any rebate. That's 6662D2A. Um, it is reduced by the portion of the understatement that's attributable to an item for which there is substantial authority or an item that was disclosed by the taxpayer and for which there is a reasonable basis. Now, I want to talk about the, uh, the definition of understatement. Again, within the context especially of low-income taxpayers that might have a frozen refund because there's some guidance for us that uh, they went back and forth a little bit, but it was determined that when dealing with frozen refunds, it's possible that there won't be any understatement to apply a penalty to. So I, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that, but if you have a frozen refund, uh, EIC, uh, especially refundable credits, where we quite often, I wouldn't say it's a majority of the time, but it's not insignificant that we freeze uh, refundable credits like their income credit. Um, you want to make sure because the notice in and of itself hopefully calculated it right, but maybe didn't because if they applied it to the frozen refund and there is no understatement, um, there might not be a penalty at all even though it's asserted. So I would urge that to your consciousness. Um, let's see. Um, 
Now, I alluded to, unless there's substantial authority, um, substantial authority is, uh, is an objective standard. It's um, they're under Treasury Regulation 1.6662-43, there is substantial authority for a position if the weight of the authorities supporting the position is substantial in relation to the weight of contrary authorities. That regulation specifies what legal authorities may be considered, and it is purely an objective determination. Therefore, a taxpayer's subjective belief isn't relevant. The, there is a little bit of gray area on um, if, because authorities looks at legal, what about a factual evidence making uh, determination. Long-term capital holdings, the regulations clearly state what can constitute substantial authority and factual arguments or evidence are not included. However, there are some countervailing holdings such as Osteen and Kluner uh, that are 11th Circuit and 6th Circuit that factual evidence can be factored in. So you will have to analyze if you have a primarily factual basis for substantial authority versus a uh, legal basis for asserting substantial authority. Um, if you pursue adequate disclosure, um, do, do not assume that you can just tack on any writing and, and say, hey, we've disclosed, because it has to be per regulations on Form 8275 or Form 8275R, uh, or in appropriate circumstances, the UTP, which is uncertain tax positions form that are highlighted in the announcement listed there, uh, announcement 2010-75 from 2010, um, indicates that you, know, you wouldn't have to do a UTP and an 8275 or 8275R as I understand it, but uh, you would have to do one of those two forms as appropriate for your circumstances. You, any other disclosure would not meet the require, requirements of the regulations, which uses the word must have those forms attached. Um, and then those exceptions are great unless you're in a tax shelter. Um, tax shelter, obviously, as you see on the slide, are defined as any entity plan or arrangement having a significant purpose for the avoidance of evasion of tax. And then you cannot use um, either substantial authority or uh, disclosure to avoid that. Uh, assertion of that penalty. Now, Ken, you mentioned earlier that counsel gets an IRS uh, a file from either exam or, or appeals, and you're responding to a, a petition, and you might have seen in the notice of deficiency a 6662D penalty uh, substantial understatement, and you said, you know, you're thinking about are we going to also allege negligence? What things are you going to look for or, or would you consider to make that decision that, you know, this really is not just computational, this is negligence? Well, right out of the gate, I've got to challenge your predicate assumption because sometimes I don't have a file or any <laughs> substantive file. Um, and, and I don't mean we've lost it. There just really wasn't one in correspondence audits. There's a very, sure. uh, sometimes not very much there. That would be the first threshold. Um, that you assumed and is not always a safe assumption. If we don't have a file, it's going, we're going to be hard-pressed to assert negligence unless we have gathered other things through informal or formal discovery. Um, okay. Assuming we have something of a substantive file, then we're going to do the analysis of uh, – but, but, but I will tell you that when we have a more substantial file, the chances are enhanced that there was an a, a assertion of both negligence and substantial understatement in the alternative under 6662. If it still isn't there, we would look at the facts that were developed in the examination if, which rarely happens, we had a pre-petition pre appeal, we would certainly look what happened there, statements made, because we're looking for the analysis of negligence and were there admissions, were there uh, filings, were there, we we're going to look at um, educational background, any, any specialized training, um, did, they, did they work with an advisor, did they seek out advice, uh, if they got advice, did they follow it, did they reasonably follow it, any, any and all of the above that's already in the file. And it, it does not have to be that it is 
absolutely proven that there was negligence based on the file we have, but there has to be, in my mind and the officer's mind, enough there if it's not asserted for us to have a foothold to further develop it and then assert it because we're going to do it at the earliest possible time that we can because prejudice starts to attach if I haven't, you know, informed the taxpayer or, and or their rep that we are adding that basis. So we need to do that at the earliest time. So how quickly can we, do we already have enough or do we have to develop it? And will developing it take us too close to, say, you know, a calendar or a trial such that prejudice would become an issue? So before we get to substantial valuation, Nancy, any thoughts on, um, do, you, do you see these penalties on a regular basis with your clients, um, the low-income taxpayer clients? I would say that we do see these a lot. Um, oftentimes they're, you know, leaving things off the return. Um, you know, they forgot or they went to a preparer who didn't know what they were doing. Um, and so we've seen both, you know, I think the – the substantial understatement, um, and we've also seen the the negligent, you know, assertion of the the negligence penalty as well. Um, I'd say that probably occurs more in relation to the earned income tax credit or dependency exemptions. Um, you know, especially if there's been issues in previous years where the taxpayer. Um, may have been audited previously and, you know, may not have been successful in proving their case. Um, so we do definitely see that um, on our side. So it's just important if we catch it early enough that we're addressing it, you know, with exams and especially if you're filing a petition in tax court, you want to make sure that you're not only challenging the issues that the IRS is raising as far as the return, but also challenging any penalties that are being asserted so that you can later um, raise that issue in tax court if needed. Okay, great. Tim, one last uh, substantial penalty here. There, that is the substantial valuation misstatement. Um, our, our office doesn't see this a lot. There certainly are those out there. Um, the under 6662 provides for a penalty where there's a substantial valuation misstatement, and generally this applies when a taxpayer misstates the value of the basis of property. Um, this applies if the value of any property or the adjusted basis of any property claimed on any return is 150% or more of the amount determined to be the correct amount under 6662E1 Cap A. Um, no a penalty would under this section would apply unless a portion of the underpayment attributable to the substantial valuation mis misstatement is greater than $5,000 for individuals and $10,000 for C corps, non S corps. Um, that's a 20% penalty if it's if it's substantial valuation misstatement. However, there's an enhanced version of it for um, gross valuation misstatement under H, which would increase to 40%, where the gross valuation is the value of the property, the adjusted basis of any property on a return is 200% or more of the amount determined to be the correct amount. Um, I, I did note in preparing that the regs do mention that if there is a zero basis stated, then the 400 is essentially deemed to be its gross. Uh, it's a gross valuation misstatement. This can also apply in net 482 adjustments as shown on your slide, um, and there the standards are either 5 million or 10 percent of gross, uh, the greater of, or the 40 percent of penalty will apply for either 20 million or 20 percent of gross receipts of, of the net penalty adjustment. There are no reasonable cause exceptions unless the taxpayer had a contemporaneous documentation of uh, their basis. Um, and I don't have a lot of insight. I've seen this a little bit in, uh, it's, it's a little dated, but we had in our office a uh, valuation of a, a um, painting in an estate case. Um, and I think it, it I, our office has experienced it most directly in estate and gift type scenarios. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say, similar to that. I think it comes up a lot in valuation, or not a lot, but it could come up in valuation type cases, gift and estate, and then Brad, maybe um, 
it was more, you know, obviously in the mid to late 2000s, there was a lot of tax shelter cases involving basis where the substantial or gross valuation misstatement penalty was at issue. Um, that's not the sta- standard run-of-the-mill case, but it did it was important, and there was at least one Supreme Court case, Woods, where the main issue was the application of the uh, 40% valuation misstatement penalty, but it's not the run-of-the-mill situation. And, and I would echo what you I apologize. I would echo what he said about in, in, in shelters and shelters and quasi shelters. Um, certainly, as coordinated, uh, we've had cadres of, uh, of issues that were shelters, or uh, I think it came up in Son of Boss or Son of Boss like transactions. Um, but go ahead, Brad. I was just going to say, in the estate and gift, it's not on the slide, but for those of you that do that kind of practice, um, 6662 G discusses that if the amount, uh, the value of any property claimed on a return is 65% or less of the amount determined, you're going to be imposed with the penalty. Um, Again, no reasonable cause exception. There's an increase uh, substituting it to 40%, and the formula is a little more complicated about the valuation. But if you're doing that type of returns, you do want to make sure that when you're working with appraisers and things, you know, concerns over aggressive discounts and, and other things, but I agree. The E and H penalty that Tim was talking about on here, I haven't seen much of this either in my practice. Um, so it's just something that people should be aware of. But we'll, we'll move on because we're almost towards the end of our uh, discussion of penalties, and we'll be getting to reasonable cause shortly. So we'll, we'll kind of keep going. Sure, I'm just going to go quickly through the non-economic substance transaction. Um, so back in 2010, Congress added section, subsection 6662I of the code, and again, a lot of this was in relation to the, tax, the, the large number of tax shelter cases where one of the arguments that the IRS and um, Department of Justice raised in a lot of those cases was that the transaction lacked economic substance. At the time, it really was uh, based on case law, arguing lack of economic substance rather than in the code. But then Congress codified Section 7701 of the code to say that a transaction needs to have, a, a, you know, objective and subjective economic substance. And then they added this 40% penalty as well as a big stick. Um, there's no reasonable cost section, but you can reduce it to 20% if you adequately disclose, um, as Tim was talking about a little while ago, on the 8275, 8275R, or the Schedule UTP but you also have to disclose on the 8886 if there's a reportable transaction. One interesting thing was because of the sensitivity around this penalty and the large, you know, the importance of the cases where economic substance was at issue, the Large Business and International Division, formerly LMSB, issued a memorandum in 2010 that said the penalty, this, this specific penalty must be reviewed and approved by the appropriate director of field operations or DFO and DFO is a pretty high level in LBNI organization, so that shows just some of the sensitivity around the penalty. And then um, there, you know, additional guidance instructing examiners and managers on how to determine when it is appropriate to seek DFO approval. So if anyone has an economic substance issue, I would highly recommend looking at those memorandums, those memos. And then from the chief counsel side, um, the Chief Counsel's Office also has a way of coordinating those cases where economic substance is involved just to make sure that everyone agrees that this is the appropriate case to raise that type of penalty. That's all on that slide. And then um, going to uh, undisclosed foreign financial assets, this also was part of the 2010 Hire Act um, where they were focusing on offshore issues and they just created this 40% penalty for any understatement attributable to a transaction involving an undisclosed foreign financial asset. And those tie back into what I was talking about earlier about the potential statute of limitations issue under 6501C8. So the co-sections listed on that slide all go to have you filed certain international information returns. And if you don't file those and if you if the IRS audits that tra- audits that taxpayer and says you you have an understatement due to that f- undisclosed foreign financial asset, the penalty goes up to 40% potentially. 
And then the uh, last sort of accuracy type penalty that we're going to talk about, although it's not technically an accuracy related penalty, is 6676, which is the erroneous claim for refund or credit penalty. This was enacted in the mid 2000s. And a lot of it goes to, again, what Tim was talking about earlier about frozen, um, certain frozen refunds. And there was a question of whether there was an accuracy related penalty that applied in that situation. So Congress enacted this 6676 penalty to say, if a taxpayer files a claim for refund and the IRS determines that there was an excessive amount of that penalty, then there could be a 20% penalty for that excessive erroneous refund claim. When it was first enacted, the statute said no penalty would apply if you had a reasonable basis. Um, and it also said that it didn't apply in the EITC context. So for whatever reason, Congress carved out EITC. But in 2015, Congress changed it to remove the EITC exception. So that is something to, for consideration for low-income taxpayers that if you file a, very, you know, a fraudulent claim for EITC, in addition to other penalties, you could potentially have a 6676 penalty. Um, but they also added a reasonable cause exception for the first time. A lot of practitioners, and I think even the government, had said, we're not sure, we think it would be better for everyone if you could have a reasonable cause exception for this penalty. So now there is a penalty, a reasonable cause exception for 6676. And for a while, I would say, I don't think there was a huge amount of these being assessed by the IRS. I don't know, Brad, if you've seen them. But we have seen a little bit of a pickup in the last three or four years, and I think the IRS has focused on it some more. So just something to keep in the back of their mind. Great. Well, now that we've gotten you know, over halfway through our presentation, we're going to switch over to our discussion about reasonable cause, and maybe this is the, the point where most of you wanted to join in about and learn some ideas and strategies that we've seen, and, and some some have worked and some have not worked. But let's talk generally first um, about reasonable cause and, and what it is. All right, thanks, Brad. Um, so the IRS will consider reasons that establish that the taxpayer used all ordinary business care and prudence to meet their federal tax obligations, but they were unable to do so. And if they can establish this, the IRS may relieve them of penalties due for that tax year. I'm going to give some examples of situations in which the IRS may grant penalty relief based on reasonable cause. So these include fire, casualty, national disaster, or other disturbances, uh, the taxpayer's inability to obtain records, death, serious illness, incapacitation, or unavoidable absence of the taxpayer or a member of the taxpayer's immediate family, or any other reason which establishes that the taxpayer used all ordinary business care and prudence to meet the obligations, but were nevertheless unable to do so. Um, so these are just some examples. I felt like most of these were pretty straightforward, um, but, I, but I also felt like the inability to obtain records seemed sort of general. So I'm going to take a little bit of a closer look at that. Um, so in, in order to use that um, as a reasonable cause, um, as a way of asserting reasonable cause, the IRS is going to look at a few different things. So they're going to look at why the records were needed to comply, why they were unavailable, and what steps the taxpayer took to secure the records, why and how the taxpayer became aware that he or she didn't have the records, if any other means were explored to secure the needed information, why the taxpayer didn't estimate the information, if they contacted the IRS for instructions about what to do, uh, if they promptly complied once the missing information was received, and the IRS will also consider supporting documentation, including copies of any letters the taxpayer may have written or responses received in an effort to get the needed information. Um, so, you know, in each situation, it's good when you're interviewing your client to really find out as much as possible about the situation, why they may not have filed or why, you know, they may have had issues with the return and what steps they may have taken to um, ameliorate the situation because, you know, if they just sort of threw up their hands and didn't really do anything, well, I don't think the IRS is going to look too kindly on that. Um, so just as an aside, a lack of funds in and of itself is not considered reasonable cause for failure to pay on time. Um, however, the reasons for the lack of funds 
can sometimes meet reasonable cause criteria for the failure to pay penalty. So, um, you know, just not having the money in and of itself is not enough, but, um, you know, if the taxpayer still is trying to act prudently and use ordinary business care, that's really the standard that the IRS is going to look at. It's possible that they may be able to achieve some relief. Now, um, as far as willful neglect is concerned, some of the penalties in, in the Internal Revenue Code require evidence that the taxpayer acted in good faith or that the taxpayer's failure to comply with the laws was not due to willful neglect. So some assert that, some do not. And the IRS defines willful neglect in the IRM as conscious, intentional failure to comply with the provisions of the IRC, of the Internal Revenue Code, or reckless indifference to such provisions. So I know we touched upon that a little bit earlier, and Tim commented on that. And, and I would think, um, at least from our perspective, you know, if we have a client who has been making the same mistakes, you know, return after return, um, you know, at a certain point, you're going to say, all right, that's enough, you know what you're doing, because at a certain point you're expecting them to learn from their mistakes. So, um, you know, I think you're going to have an uphill battle if it's, you know, year three of, of sort of the, the same issue over and over. Um, so talking a little bit about ordinary business care and prudence, um, that includes making arrangements for business obligations to be met when reasonably foreseeable events occur. So, um, you know, making other provisions, making other arrangements if something could potentially come up. So it's not just filing on time, paying on time, and following those obligations, but also ensuring that, you know, perhaps in your absence or, if, you know, something happens that you're still able to meet your obligations. And a taxpayer can establish reasonable cause by providing facts and circumstances that he or she exercise ordinary business care and prudence. Um, and the IRS is supposed to, you know, take into account the degree of care that a reasonably pr prudent person would exercise. Um, but if they were still unable to comply with the law, it's possible they would be eligible for relief. So in determining if the taxpayer ex exercised ordinary business care and prudence, the IRS is going to review a few main things. Um, these include the taxpayer's reason, their compliance history, the length of time um, the, you know, between the issue and when they rectify the problem, and circumstances beyond the taxpayer's control. And I'm going to go um, a little more into detail with these. So as far as the taxpayer's reason, it, it should address the penalty Im imposed. So to show reasonable cause, dates, and explanations should clearly correspond with the events on which the penalties are based. So, you know, if you're filing late, you want to assert something that may have occurred at that time, not something that occurred after the fact or, you know, two years prior um, that may have prevented, you know, the return from being filed on time. The IRS will also look at compliance history. So they're going to check the preceding tax years, at least three, for payment patterns and the taxpayer's overall compliance history. Um, so the same penalty previously assessed or abated may indicate to the IRS that the taxpayer is not exercising ordinary business care. Um, however, if this is the taxpayer's first incident of noncompliant behavior, the IRS may weigh this factor with some other reasons um, that the taxpayer gives for reasonable cause, since a first-time failure to comply does not by itself establish reasonable cause. They will also look at the length of time between the events cited as the reason for noncompliance and the subsequent compliance. So in terms of a practice tip there, it's really best for the taxpayer to try to correct the mistake as soon as possible, um, you know, once they learn of the mistake because the IRS will be looking at, you know, the length of time between um, the noncompliance and when they make it right. So they will consider when the act was required by law, the period of time during which the taxpayer was unable to comply with the law due to circumstances beyond the taxpayer's control, and then when the taxpayer ended up complying with the law. As far as circumstances beyond the taxpayer's control, the IRS will consider whether or not the taxpayer could have anticipated the event that caused the noncompliance. And reasonable cause is generally established when the taxpayer does exercise ordinary business care and prudence but due to circumstances beyond the taxpayer's control, the taxpayer was unable to timely meet the tax obligation. 
So ordinary business care and prudence requires that the taxpayer continue to attempt to meet the requirements even though late. So not just throwing up their hands in the air, but, but still trying to um, remedy the situation. So just in, in general terms, when the IRS is trying to determine whether a taxpayer may be eligible for reasonable cause, they're going to look at what happened, how did it happen, when did it happen, what facts and circumstances provided prevented the taxpayer um, from fulfilling their obligations. Um, once the facts and circumstances changed, did the taxpayer take action to uh, comply? And um, in the case of a corporation, a state, or trust, did the affected person or member of the individual's immediate family have sole authority to execute the return or make the deposit or payment? Now, some helpful documents to provide um, in support of a, you know, request for penalty abatement based on reasonable cause, maybe hospital or court records or a letter from a physician that can help to establish the taxpayer's illness or maybe a family member's illness or incapacitation, making sure to have specific start and end dates. Other documents may include documentation of natural disasters or other events that have prevented compliance. Um, as you know, we've had quite a few of those um, across the nation this year especially. So. Um, making sure to document that so that, you know, especially failure to file, failure to pay, um, the taxpayer can get some relief. And then um, as far as strategy in that vein, so, you know, making a good faith payment to show that um, the, the failure to comply was really due to reasonable cause and not willful neglect. Now, the so IRS is... I'm sorry, go ahead. So we'll say, let's take two examples real quick to see if um, everyone kind of is on the same page and, and let you comment as you're continuing to talk about good strategies. So the first example here is the taxpayer has a job, uh, receives his W-2 and has the wages, but runs a small business on the side and doesn't report the income he got in in cash. He went to the tax return preparer pick one, and he gave them the W-2, but didn't even mention the small business, the IRS audits discovers no tax, taxpayer fails to um, submit Schedule C because they did some sort of review of the bank account and saw some of the cash deposits. That's where it came out. So the question there is, is there a penalty or not? And let's look at example two, and then we can talk about them. Example two, similar situation, but now we have an inheritance and the inheritance included some sort of asset like stocks that generated income on its own. So the, the thought that, you know, you don't pay tax on the inheritance, but what do you do about the income that might be generated? So he goes to the, you know, his fly-by night down the street, save you tax company, gives him the W-2 and tells him he got inheritance. But this situation is the tax return repair didn't ask any follow-up questions. And now we're under audit and find out there's unreported income from the dividends and things that got generated on the stocks that were reinvested. And, you know, he was advised maybe, but maybe not advised because the um, tax return prepared didn't have all the information. So, Nancy, if either of these situations came into your house uh, to deal with, what, what would you first think through? Um, I think, well, first off, I'd want to get every detail I could and any documentation. Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of taxpayers come in here that went to return preparers and may not have been, you know, they may not have done the right thing, that either the taxpayer forgot to include income or the preparer actually um, didn't know what they were doing or, you know, purposely made changes to the return. So we want to get information about, you know, what was discussed, do they have any documentation from the meeting with the preparer indicating, you know, what income they may have considered, what they didn't. So oftentimes preparers will have checklists and things like that um, to see if there was any reliance on the preparer. Um, we would also look to see if there was anything, you know, because I think in some of these situations, you know, you're going to be looking at an accuracy-related penalty. Um, and if we can try to reduce the amount of unreported income, so in the first example, the taxpayer was self-employed, if we can come up with some business expenses, um, you know, proof of business expenses that would help lower the amount of unreported income because, you know, we're going to be reporting the, the net business income, perhaps that would help to lessen or even get rid of 
the accuracy-related penalty. Um, in terms of, you know, reasonable cause, um, in the first case, the taxpayer, it doesn't seem like he really relied on anything that the preparer did per se. He just didn't tell the preparer of the other income, and so the preparer had no way of knowing. Um, so it would seem that, you know, that it's really the taxpayer's issue. In the second situation, the preparer probably should have known better. Um, and so if the taxpayer can prove that the preparer was um, reputable and someone that the taxpayer should be able to rely on, perhaps he'd be able to get some penalty relief based on reasonable cause for um, relying on the preparer, expecting him to do the right thing, but then the preparer fails to do so. Um, and I'd like to, I'm curious to see what, um, you know, Tim or Michael would say, but I, I wonder if the IRS, though, would, would question, you know, whether the taxpayer should have known, you know, to ask about it, you know, if it's missing from the return, should he have asked about it? Um, I'm not sure how closely they would scrutinize that. Yeah, and from my, this is Matt, not, I'm not working with the government, but it seems like I think the government would be skeptical just from my view, and they would at least ask, well, why didn't you know? What Did you ask the questions? Did you have something from the preparer saying you don't have to include it? Is it too good to be true not to include that information? So the first situation seems really bad. The second situation seems bad, too. So. <laughs> Bad, the, the, diff uncommon. <laughs> the, 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 the difficulty you have with preparers, and I think, was it Brad that said the down the street preparer, is the, the, the hardest thing I find is how does the average individual decide who's a good preparer and a bad preparer? And that, that's the tough part. And is it, I think uh, it was Matt who said too good to be true plays a role in it. Um, did they ask the question, those sorts of things. But I, the the preparer is a double-edged sword because is, if it's just so blatantly obvious this is not a good preparer, the, uh, I, I say kind of tongue-in-cheek, if they're out of the back of the sedan <laughs> mobile unit or something, maybe you should strongly question whether this is the right place to be. But if they are otherwise appear to be reputable but really aren't, uh, that's the tough part because the double-edged sword is should they have known better than to rely on them? Or, or if, if not, shouldn't they have been able to rely on them? But now, in hindsight, when it's on our desk, clearly they shouldn't have been uh, reliant, and maybe they weren't up to the standard that reliance is reasonable. But uh, that's that's a tough analysis to do, um, and, and we try to be reasonable and fair about it, but we at, at some point have to say, you know, like Matt alluded to, did you ask the question? Did you bring it to them? Because it's not reasonable to rely on it if you didn't ask and you knew you had it and didn't give them anything. If they then did ask and did get advice and they had it presented to them, then it comes down to should they have relied on that based on the circumstances. Now, Tim, do you take into account things like the taxpayer's level of education or the taxpayer's age when you're trying to determine if they should have relied on the preparer. Absolutely, back, background. Uh, you know, obviously, again, the extreme example is if they had some training in tax and, and accounting or something like that, um, then they have a heightened standard if their education level. It's also relevant to re relative to the education level compared to the topic that we're talking about. Did, you know, is this something that the average person at that education level, age, you know, are they ill? anything like that, should we, we would factor that into the decision-making on that topic. And then how normal, how reasonable, how, you know, how accessible is that area of the code and law to that individual's level of understanding? And is it, would it be reasonable for the expect? If it's a reverse triangular merger, you know, that's why they go to, to Brad or Matt. And if it's, if it's um, a more straightforward, you received income, from some source, you should at least ask about income. Should I include this as income type of level Re would require a much lower standard of uh, of training and, and, and knowledge on their part. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think a lot of times, yeah, it's, 
going to I, – I try to make the argument that the, even if the person is a successful business person and, you know, they're, they might be a high-wealth individual, it doesn't mean that they're sophisticated in, you know, U.S. tax laws if that's why they're going to an advisor. But that's more of not – again, not like, just like Tim was saying, not unreported income for a basic income. It's a substantive technical question. Uh, and I, I can weigh in there in in a in a bigger case that I was before I was a supervisor. Um, there was a very circumstance where it was very reasonable, a, a very knowledgeable at his business uh, clothier um, went and got advice in a what ended up being arguably a shelter. Um, but uh, so he was a savvy businessman in what he did, but otherwise had no significant training or awareness in tax and went to what you would have expected to have been a very reliable resource for him. And so we did strongly factor in in that circumstance that he, albeit a very savvy businessman, was not particularly savvy in Texas and went to a firm that should have he should have been able to rely on in factoring what we did with penalties. It was for settlement purposes, but it was still certainly a factor um, from a very successful person. Tim, on that comment, I struggle a little bit with articulating reasonable cause, and we have a question from the audience about what if the taxpayer tax return didn't include the foreign disclosure, the 5471, indicating the person is a U.S. shareholder in a, a controlled foreign corporation. Um, and the, the issue is obviously, and, and the fact pattern would be that the taxpayer doesn't know about the requirement to file these foreign forms. Their accountant's never told them. And the accountant knows about the existence of the corporation. Now, that's, that's a key fact, I think, because I have a case currently where I don't know that the, the accountant actually knew the existence of the corporations, but I think the accountant knew that the client had investments in a foreign country. Now, what precisely type of investment is unclear but, you know, relying on an advisor to make you aware of certain things, Tim, does that, you know, that's a weird line to me. I don't know if you have any thoughts on how that line gets drawn. Uh, uh, certainly nothing that w nothing definitive. It, it, it's because the, the, the easy, good lawyer answer <laughs> from my perspective is it is facts and circumstances. You've got to look at the whole picture. Um, and uh, the... But but I do think I tend to agree with your comment about the if the person is revealing if they're laying it all out for the advisor and it was you know reasonable for the advisor if you hold back from the advisor and don't give the advisor an opportunity then it's probably not reasonable or in good faith or both um, to, to have relied on that but if you lay it all out and the advisor fails you I, I I'm not going to say that that certainly is automatic, but it, it certainly uh, ups the ante, I would think. And do you, um, Michael, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. We just have to take into account all the facts and circumstances, and yeah. that would yeah. be something we, we think about. Yeah, and Tim, yeah, I can use that as a, yeah, sorry, go. I was going to say, Brad, I can use that as a segue to really, a lot of that comes down to reasonable reliance on a tax advisor. Um, and the regs say specifically that it does not, like Tim and Michael are saying, it does not necessarily demonstrate reasonable cause and good faith, um, but it is a factor to consider. And if such, really, one of the key facts is was the reliance reasonable um, and did this, was it reasonable for the taxpayer to rely on that preparer? And if, um, if you go ahead a couple of slides, Brad, there's a case, uh, it comes down to there's a case, United States versus Boyle, which is a big Supreme Court case that a lot of you have probably heard about. And it, it says here it limits the ability to rely on an advisor. Um, and what that case is saying is if it's, an, if it's a ministerial or administrative error by the preparer or by a tax advisor, then in a lot of situations that's not reasonable cause. So if you um, give your tax return, as a simple example, your 1040 to your advisor, your advisor is sending it in for you on your behalf and they just forget to mail it in for whatever reason, oftentimes that's not going to be reasonable cause and the government would point to Boyle to say 
no, that's an administrative error and you a ministerial error on your preparer's behalf. The the obligation to actually file the return is on you, the taxpayer. It's not a delegable obligation, and so that can go to re um, so that's uh, sometimes a hard hurdle to go into, and we can talk a little bit about that at the end. But an interesting thing is, I would I would take the position that based on the question that was asked, if the taxpayer is not extremely sophisticated in tax laws, they give their CPA the information about their foreign corporation, and the advisor gives them incorrect advice that says you do not have an obligation. I would say that that taxpayer has a good argument for reasonable cause. And I would point to that a state of their own case, or however you pronounce it, in the Third Circuit. Where there, the Third Circuit reversed the district court, and they made a distinction between three different types of cases. They said that reasonable cause, the first situation is the ministerial or administrative error. And there they said, you know, Boyle says clearly that you do not have reasonable cause generally in that context. The second situation is if a preparer or advisor gives you incorrect information about your filing due date, and that's not really for a 1040s or 1120 filing date, which everyone should generally know. It's more if it's some kind of a state return or something that's more complex and you get bad advice as to when the return is due. That can be reasonable cause. That's a factual circumstance. And then the third situation, which I would argue this example might come under, is if the advisor gives you bad um, technical advice and it's just to be it's just incorrect about whether you have a filing obligation in the first place um, then as long as it's reasonable the person is a reputable preparer it was reasonable for you to rely on them then that can be reasonable cause and Matt on this one I think it's a little different because the estate tax one is the one that's more common you know you look at the assets you make a determination there's no obligation to file in this context the 5471 I think the question from the audience but my situation too I don't think the accountant knew that there even that type of filing even existed so it's not like they gave advice saying you don't have to file if they didn't give any advice at all because they didn't know it existed so that's to me yeah, that might even be a fourth category under this case scenario yeah that's different I was talking about where the advisor says you do not you affirmatively do not have a filing obligation because of some technical position that may be wrong yeah. later on and then Boyle obviously has been around for a long time. My favorite story from the updated version of Boyle is for those Red Sox fans from Ovon who tried to uh, obviously hire someone to deal with his tax filings. And that company decided to allegedly, according to Mr. Vaughn, uh, take his money and not file his returns. And his, his penalty r relief or abatement was saying he hired a reputable company to manage his finances and affairs. I'm pretty sure the court came down similar to Boyle saying you can't delegate that duty. you got to make sure it gets filed even though you hire out. Maybe you have some sort of claim against them. But Boyle's been around for a long time, and I think it still is a, is a key one to look at when you're thinking about reliance. You know, what type of reliance are we talking about? Just not filing or substantive positions on returns or things you want to kind of carve out. Right. Yeah, so that's just a big a lot of times, yeah, you like Nancy was saying, you always have to ask the questions, what did you tell your advisor? What did what documentation did you give your advisor? Documentation is key in proving or supporting your reasonable cause argument and having anything in writing always is very helpful with exam, but especially in appeals or with counsel. Um, and then I was going to quickly note that there are some Penalties that do not have any reasonable cause exception. I think Tim mentioned substantial valuation for transfer pricing unless there's contemporaneous documentation, um, non-economic substance. Uh, the third bullet is not correct anymore. It used to be the case for certain years that there wasn't for the erroneous claim for a refund, um, but now there is a reasonable cause for 16 for returns filed starting in 2016. So it just depends on when you file the return, and then. Another big one just to mention is we, we didn't talk about it, but oftentimes individuals will get estimated tax penalty notices, but for corporations, if you have an underpayment of estimated tax under 6655, since that really is equivalent to interest pre-return filing, there is no reasonable cause exception for that, um, for that penalty. And the only way to really get rid of it is if you can fill out the form 2220 to show that 
the penalty should be lower or zero using some kind of method or calculation in determining how much estimated tax is owed. Okay, great. So we're going to jump into um, first-time penalty abatement now. So in addition to requesting penalty relief based on reasonable cause, the IRS can also provide administrative relief from a penalty under certain conditions. And the most widely available administrative waiver is first-time penalty abatement. It can be used to abate the failure to file, failure to pay, and failure to pay, the, I'm sorry, failure to deposit penalties for one tax year when you have a clean compliance history for the three prior years. You can also use first-time penalty abatement um, for, you know, this relates to Form 1040, Form 1120, and payroll and pass-through entities. Now, a taxpayer will qualify if he has not been required to file a return or has no prior penalties for the preceding three years and has filed or filed an extension for all currently required returns and has paid or arranged to pay any tax currently due. Um, the great thing about requesting penalty relief now is you should be able to call um, to request relief under first-time penalty abatement um, regardless of the amount of the penalty. So that was that changed in 2015 before um, you, depending on the amount, if it was above a certain amount, you weren't able to call to just request it, but now you should be able to. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on the current IRS proposal, which is to automatically apply first-time penalty abatement. The National Taxpayer Advocate, um, Nina Olson, raised this issue in her most serious problems recently um, in her annual report and on her blog. Um, she has concerns that the IRS may implement this program in a way that overrides reasonable cause relief, which in effect would violate taxpayer rights. Um, additionally, IRS would be elevating first-time abatement and IRS remedy above reasonable cause, which is actually a statutory remedy um, created by Congress. And the National Taxpayer Advocate is pushing the IRS to develop systems that first consider eligibility for reasonable cause prior to the application of the first-time abatement. Um, and I think this would be a great, point, uh, great time, Brad, if you want to read that question that we had regarding first-time abatement and reasonable cause. Yeah, so we had someone in the audience ask earlier on that if the IRS defaults to the first-time penalty abatement and doesn't go to a reasonable cause first, is there a way you can try to convince them to look at reasonable cause, I guess, in the theory to save the first-time abatement for another instance? Right, so I think that's definitely a good practice to save first-time abatement since you're really limited in terms of how often you get to use it. It's really just one every... Um, three, four years, really, um, because you have to have not used it and have that compliance record for the three prior years. Um, and so, I mean, I think just pointing out, first of all, what I just said, which is that, you know, the reasonable cause is written into the statute. First-time penalty abatement is a provision in the IRM. It's IRS procedure. So IRS should not be elevating their own procedures above the law. And it sounds like you will have to push back on this issue, um, you know, ask them to point to, you know, where they're getting the authority to apply first-time abatement first, because I think it is their general practice to do that, but it is not a requirement that they first try to apply um, first-time abatement. And I think if you're still unsuccessful, it wouldn't hurt to try to involve the taxpayer advocate service, um, you know, to assert your right to use reasonable cause first and preserve first-time penalty abatement um, for a potential leader issue that may come up. Um, so there are, you know, a few things, few penalties that are not going to be eligible for first-time penalty abatement because that is limited to failure to file, failure to pay, and failure to deposit penalties. Um, so estimated tax penalty and accuracy-related penalties related to tax return errors will not be eligible for the first-time abatement. Um, but as a strategy, it is good to evaluate your, ca your case for reasonable cause first and use that, if possible, to preserve first-time abatement. Um, and first-time abatement usually is easier to request, assuming that the taxpayer has been compliant. Um, so you definitely want to do your research first, pull the account transcripts, review if they've been filing on time and paying on time for the three prior years. If there is an amount owing, you know, 
you would want, I guess that relates more to a reasonable cause. If there's a balance owed, you know, try to get them on a payment plan first before requesting the penalty abatement so that you're making sure that they're meeting all of the criteria to be eligible for relief. Um, in terms of other resources, there is something I found that I've never used before. I don't know if anyone else here has, but I noticed something about a penalty appeal online self-help tool for taxpayers. Um, I guess that's in a situation where your request for penalty relief is denied and there's some sort of online help tool. So I can't really speak as to its helpfulness, um, but I did see that as an available resource um, via the IRS website. Before we, I just, the only thing going to Nancy's, I would just add, uh, I assume everyone knows, but it's usually it's very helpful if you can call the IRS practitioner hotline. You can Google it, or I think it's 866-860-4259, and you can talk if, as long as you have a power of attorney already on file or you fax it to them. They can give you a lot of helpful information, including if you're eligible for FTA. Okay, we're going to switch to one last slide on managerial approval, and then we'll do some last-minute tips before we wrap up. All right, so I'm going to try to move through uh, this section on 6751B1 quickly, uh, just so we can get to those best practices. Uh, but this section has been a hot topic for the last about a year and a half um, in the tax court, and I'm sure some of our panelists are familiar with this, as well as uh, field counsel. Um, and a lot of this is addressed in the chief counsel notice that we will talk about that's cited on the slide. Uh, but 6751B1 requires personal written supervisory approval of the initial determination of a penalty assessment. Um, and this section applies to all 20, Title 26 penalties, um, except for penalties under 6651, 6654, and 6655, those being the failure to pay, failure to, failure to file, um, and then failure to pay estimated income tax penalties. Uh, it also doesn't apply to automatically calculated penalties that are calculated through electronic means. Um, and I think Tim talked a little bit earlier about how, you know, substantial understatement penalty is one of these penalties that's often automatically calculated. Uh, but the reason why this is uh, such a big topic right now is because of a, the grave chai line of cases. Um, and in grave, um, and this case is usually referred to as grave one, there are three, uh, the tax court disallowed a charitable contribution deduction for the contribution of an easement. And in grave two, the taxpayer actually argued uh, that the penalties were barred because the IRS hadn't obtained uh, proper approval of the 20% penalty under 6662A and B1 uh, for a negligence or substantial understatement. And in that case, uh, the tax court decided that at the time, the 6651B argument was premature because the IRS hadn't assessed the liability. Uh, but within a couple months, um, the Second Circuit actually reached an opposite conclusion in Chai. Uh, the Second Circuit held that the written approval requirement of 6751B is in fact an element of the penalty claim and is properly before the tax court um, in a deficiency proceeding. Uh, they further held that the IRS has the burden of proving it complied with 6751B uh, as part of its uh, penalty case. So the Second Circuit said that the IRS did have the burden of proof um, as part of its penalty case to uh, assert the 6751 written managerial approval as evidence. Um, but following Chai, uh, the tax court then vacated Grave 2 and ordered additional briefing on the matter. And in Grave 3, uh, the tax court only partially adopted the Second Circuit's holding, um, and they held that in deficiency case, uh, this written supervisory approval must occur no later than the date the Internal Revenue Service either mails a notice of deficiency or files an answer or amended answer actually asserting the penalties. So in addition, the tax court held that the service's burden of production for penalties under 7491C uh, includes producing evidence of compliance with Section 6751B. So the IRS does have the burden of production when it comes to the 6751B1 managerial approval. However, the tax court uh, 
didn't adopt the Second Circuit's holding as to the burden of proof. Uh, so once the commissioner meets his, meets his burden production of uh, producing evidence of this written managerial approval, uh, the burden of proof ends on the taxpayer to prove that the application of the penalty is inappropriate in these cases. Um, and Chief Counsel notice uh, 2018-006 does uh, advise Chief Counsel attorneys how to address um, compliance with 67B1 uh, when handling these penalties in litigation. Um, it's a valuable resource and it does include discussion of grave and chai um, as well as uh, how to address compliance in deficiency cases, CDP cases, um, and refund cases as well, as well, and includes examples of evidence um, of compliance, as well as a detailed discussion of some of the exceptions that I mentioned above to 6751B1. Yeah, and I would just add on before we do the last tips that if you have a case, if you're a private practitioner and you have a case in appeals and litigation especially, right, you you want to look at those cases, look at what the IRS rules are for following in the chief counsel notice of Michael, because it might be something of help to certain cases. Tim, are you seeing that issue raised a lot in your tax court yeah. cases? Yes, and we are getting better at, as an organization, I don't mean literally us here in Richmond, but um, initially the court was struggling, I, in my view, in our view, in practice, struggling with where it could go. I had some interesting conversations with the court that I think personally not organization, you know, not speaking on behalf of the organization, went a little too far in making, in how far we had to go to prove it. Uh, an instance that I can think of is that there was a rep on the other side. We had reached a settlement. We had there was no controversy over the penalty. They had signed off on a penalty. The court in the court made me or our office literally me standing up for us prove that we had shown it to the other side, and I had to recontact the practitioner. <laughs> and in pro se, I could understand that sort of protection, but with a I, I admitted tax court attorney, I didn't think that was necessary. We've moved from that sort of strong end to the spectrum to the court is we're actively providing it at the front end, having given it or showing the court that because of no contact, we don't have to. We give it even in motions to dismiss or for entries of decision. And it's becoming more regular and easily implemented with the court accepting it the way we've done it, not without exception, but it's becoming a standardized thing, but we're having to do it in every instance that there's a panel, to, you know, that we're, you know, motion for entry or things like that, we're having to do that as a, as a matter of course. Okay, and then I think we're going to wrap up with some just tips and I'll start with from just uh, from an audit perspective. I think Nancy will do more from the uh, clinic perspective. But if you're in an audit, I think you want to generally give a written reasonable cost statement to your exam agent, or if it's in court, you know, if it's an appeals, give a statement explaining why you meet the factors for a reasonable cause. You want to try and distinguish Boyle if possible, if there's an issue of if it's a ministerial error. Um, oftentimes, we'll ask for a meeting with. Uh, with the, uh, the manager and the and the agent and the counsel attorney, if that's in, just to go over the penalty, so that you can have someone um, decide if you think there is a good reasonable cause argument. And then the real key is documentation for appeals, especially. You want to have documentation showing here's what you were told, here's why, and documentation goes a long way to getting penalties abated. And then Nancy, do you want to go from your end? Sure, I'll, I'll add on a few to that. Um, just based on our experiences here at the clinic, we do see a lot of failure to file and failure to pay penalties. Um, so if you're dealing with that, what we would recommend is um, if you are going to, if you anticipate requesting penalty abatement on sort of rolling penalties like those, it may be advisable to either wait until the penalty's been paid or everything but the penalty's been paid and then request the penalty relief. 
um, because if you request the penalty relief but the balance remains there, it is possible that the IRS could go back and assert more penalties if the balance stays unpaid. Um, so usually the recommendation there is to wait until you've paid it off. Um, if you have paid it off in full, you can still request that the IRS abate the penalties, and they're supposed to refund you um, the amount of the penalty, which we have been successful in doing. Um, and additionally, as far as compliance, we get a lot of taxpayers that um, file late. Um, you know, sometimes they owed, sometimes they didn't, sometimes it's just a matter of filing late. Now, just because you aren't assert, as, assessed a penalty for filing late doesn't mean, you know, you're not hurt by filing late because it, with issues like first-time penalty abatement with requesting that sort of administrative waiver, if they're looking at the three prior years, um, if you didn't owe but you still filed late, well, that's going to count against you. So it's still good to encourage your clients to remain compliant, um, whether or not they're going to end up owing because it could end up um, hurting them later on. So, um, And then I just want to distinguish a little bit between calling to request the abatement and then you can also request it. Um, I think you can just you know write a request uh, like Matt mentioned, but you can also use Form 843 to request penalty abatement, that's IRS Form 843, and I believe the instructions advise that you should file one form for each different tax period or type of tax that you are requesting relief for. Um, so it can be requested over the phone, but if you are, you know, trying to provide additional documentation in support of your claim, you may want to do that via written correspondence. Well, it is time to conclude this program. We, again, appreciate all of you uh, attending and participating. And if you have any questions that weren't answered, please send me an email, and I'll be happy to make sure we find someone to get you an answer. Uh, we sincerely appreciate our two speakers from the IRS, uh, Michael Franklin and Tim Hevner, for their time and efforts in participating. And big thank you to Matt Cooper, who did the bulk of the work in setting up this uh, webinar and the materials, so we thank him. Anything that was wrong, blame me, but the good stuff, we give credit to uh, Matt for that. So again, thank you. If you didn't get a chance to check out the Community Tax Law Project's website, please do and learn more about that. If you're interested in volunteering, we're always looking for volunteers. Nancy can always use help in helping serve the taxpayers. So again, thank you all for participating, and we'll be contacting you with your uh, continuing legal ed information so you can get your credit for that process. Thanks everyone, have a good day. Thank you.